very thankful for the public prayer that was offered up on our behalf and I'd certainly ask that you would continue to pray for the furthest of this service and I certainly desire an interest in your prayers this morning. I confess to you that over the last few weeks my studies and my meditation and my thoughts have not been what they should have been. We've been moving and, and running around like as some would say chickens with their heads cut off and we've been very tired and I'm not here to make excuses I'm just telling you I haven't been in God's word as I should be and in and, and prayer as I should be so I certainly ask that you pray for me that in spite of my lack of efforts that God might bless me to proclaim his glorious truth the things that are on my mind this morning is the thoughts of perception how do you perceive things to be you know, we can perceive the condition of the church, the condition of the nation, and you know, if we was to sit here and talk to each and every one of you in this congregation, uh, we would get many different views. Many of us have perceived things to be better than they are, or worse than they are, or of in, in, it can go in many, many directions, so we are, are extremely... Uh, taken to how we perceive things and the condition of our lives and the, and the condition of the nation and, and so on and so on. But before we get over there to that, I, I want to go to a verse that I've heard preached on many times that I believe is interpreted in, in, in short order, if you might say. It's in Isaiah 6 and 16. It's a very familiar verse to many folks. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. Now, I've heard this verse preached many times to explain that the church of God, and we being the church of God, as some would think, that we are to walk in paths of a certain way, and most of the time these paths are old paths. And talking about our perception of things, you, you've heard older folks say, well, uh, it was sure a lot better in the old days. The good old days. We hear about that, and every generation that come along, comes along talks about the good old days. The things are just not as good today as they were then. Now, oftentimes when I've heard this uh, particular verse preached upon, it, they're talking about the practice of the church and the doctrines of grace. And I will not deny that those truths are presented or embraced in this verse, but I believe this verse goes far beyond those teachings, far beyond it. Matter of fact, I think if you study this verse, you get a picture of Jesus Christ in this verse. I really believe that. It says, Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways. What does Jesus tell us in John 14 and 6? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is the way, the life, and the truth. It says here, stand ye in the ways, in the ways of Jesus Christ, and see, consider. Let's understand some things. Our life as a Christian and as a child of God, it's not just about the way we get to heaven. It's not just about doing what old Baptists or any other men have done for years and years, which have become the tradition of the church. I tell you what, if you go to Mark chapter 7, you'll find that under the Pharisees there were traditions fallen to the point that they could help them as high as they did the very scripture and teaching of God Almighty. Those men followed the commandments of men, and the traditions of men more than the commandments of God. Now, let's get, I'll give you an example for a minute. We meet here at 1030. We sing for 30 minutes. We preach for an hour. Then we have a handshake. And then we go have this good lunch that the sisters have fixed. Now, I'm not against any of those things, but I'm here to tell you that you'll find very little scripture support for the traditions that you and I have come up with through the years on how we conduct a service. That's a tradition. But I'll assure you that if you start changing things and you don't follow that tradition very much longer, you'll be ostracized all over the country. You really will. Because you are following, they're doing something that is not in the mainstream of what has been done forever and ever. It says here, 
Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Now, I think a lot of people in misinterpret the old paths. These were the original paths, the eternal paths, the everlasting paths that have never changed. They were given to us by the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's never been any change in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the path that was considered in the Old Testament, and it is the path that we should consider today. Many people believe that, well, we've fallen off the path. We're not doing the things right. If you do anything that's not followed after the traditions of, of the church or out in the world of what you've done all your life, you're going down the wrong path. I've heard this taught and I've heard it preached. Matter of fact, I've heard a verse used, and it's been on my mind a lot, and I'll throw it out there in Isaiah 9 and 16. It says, the leaders of this people do cause them to err, and they that let them are destroyed. The problem I have with that verse is sometimes those who proclaim that truth are the very ones who are shutting the doors and going out of business. You know, have you ever heard the old saying, you can't see the forest for the trees? It happens. It really does. Sometimes we march to a drumbeat and walk down a path so long we can't consider anything else. Is it scriptural? Are we doing what God called upon us to do? As I stated, the church is not these walls that we're set in this morning. As Brother Marty stated, we are blessed to come together for a couple of hours a week to worship. But service starts as soon as worship is over. It never ends. We spoke last week on entering into the rest. He that will love life and see good days. I believe that cannot happen unless we enter into the rest of Jesus Christ. I really believe that. I don't believe you can have real peace. I don't believe that you can meet the challenges of life and tackle the hard problems unless you're resting in Jesus Christ. Because you're going to have them in this life. I promise you that. He said, in this world you shall have tribulations. Not a one of us are going to be bypassed in that category. You're going to have your difficulties. You're going to have your challenges to face in life. But here we find these old paths. I believe they're the everlasting paths, the ways of God. It says, where is the good way? It is the way of Jesus Christ. I am the way. It's not just the way to heaven. It's the way to a glorious life right here and now. It's a fulfillment of life now, not just when you get to heaven. He said, I am the way now. Yes, he is the way to our eternal gift of everlasting life. He is the way there. But he is the way to your joy, your peace, your comfort, your hope, your real rest in this life right here and now. He says, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Notice the word walk there. Does that, just like I stated last Sunday, come unto me all ye that labor and heavy laden and I will give you rest. You know, most people don't believe that you'd have to labor to get rest. Work, you'd have to work to get rest. Most people think that rest is sitting down and doing nothing. Here it says walk. Walk in the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not about just the way to heaven. It's not just about whether you and I are doing everything proper in the practice of the church. It's conforming our lives to the lives of the Lord Jesus Christ is what this verse is talking about. Every day we ought to be more conformed to the image of our Savior Jesus Christ. That is in our thinking, in our ways, in our life, in all that we do. He is the everlasting path. He is the good way. He is our hope. Notice what the end of this verse says. You will find rest for your souls, but they said, we will not walk therein. Do you know that the same, folks say the same thing today? There's plenty of them. It's, this is not just to the children of Israel who were found in disobedience. There's a number of God's people who will tell you today, I'll not walk therein. I know that eternal life is in Jesus Christ, but I've got things to do, places to go, jobs and demands out here in the world, and I don't have time for him. They may not say it in those words, but they'll live life under that condition. I'll tell you right now, you, don't have not, you do not have, a, you, you cannot say that word. I, mean, I don't know how to word it. You can't afford not to have time for it is what I want to say. You really can't. 
He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the path. He is the way of righteousness. He is your hope. You know, I've thought much upon the old Baptist doctrine, and I love it. Because I know that by God's sovereign grace, every one of his children in this house and every house, no matter what denomination it is, I know how they're getting to heaven. I understand that. And I rejoice in it. But I tell you, it's not my duty to go out and pound those who do not understand that and do not have a clear teaching on that. I think so much about Gideon. When Gideon finally got to the point of believing that God would deliver the children of Israel under his hand, where did he go? He went to his father's house. He started at home. We got enough to deal with in our own house without bothering other folks. The Lord is able. We got enough to deal with in our own house. He cut down the grove. He broke down the altar. And you know, he done the right thing because God was with him and his father stood beside him when all the other men were angry. You might be surprised in life when you do the right thing how many folks will stand with you. That's what we need to be doing. We need to stand up for Jesus Christ and do the right thing and not worry about what men demand of us. Now, I said something about perception. You may not agree with my interpretation of this scripture. That's okay. But I believe that this scripture goes far beyond what I've heard it preached many times. This, preacher, this, this scripture teaches us more about Christ than we won't admit. We can only find rest in Jesus Christ. We can. When we labor to enter into that rest, remember when I told you about the children of Israel who wandered around that Mount Sinai for 40 years because of unbelief? They never entered in to God's rest. I believe there are multitudes of God's people today who do not enter into his rest because of unbelief. Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. We all have that problem. We believe God is mighty in power and in strength and able, yet so often we don't believe that he will be there for us in that capacity, that he will give us that ability, that he will really help us with our problems. That's why the Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ is a personal Savior. He's one that knows the number of hairs upon your head. He knows the feelings of your infirmities. He knows exactly where you are in life and what your problems are. I may not know them, but the Lord Jesus Christ knows them. He said he had never leave thee nor forsake thee, that you may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Is the Lord your helper? Are you that close to the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you entered into those paths and those ways? What is your perception of life. Perception of this scripture. What do you perceive that's being taught here? I want to move on and take the remainder of my marks concerning that. As I said, perception is everything in life. It's amazing if you were to take the youngest folks in this congregation and the oldest folks in this congregation, I imagine you'd get a total different perception of about every subject you could come up with. What do you think about the condition of the United States of America? What do you think about the conditions of the church? There's many, many things that you can consider when you talk about perception. It's your notions, your ideas, how you perceive that things are. You know, that's something that we, do, we come up with in our own mind. We look out throughout our lives and the world that we live in, and we have an idea of how things are. You know, sometimes we have an idea of how the church is. I've heard people tell me that the world is, is in bad a condition as it's ever been in. But I tell you, if you study God's word, I don't believe that to be so. I'm not saying that we don't have our problems, but do you really believe the world's as bad as it could possibly be? I don't. I don't believe that for a minute. What about the times of Sodom and Gomorrah? Is it as bad as then? I'm not here to tell you that it's perfect now. By no means is it. What about the time that God confounded the language when they were building the Tower of Babel? What about the time when God sent the flood and Noah found grace in the Lord's eyes and everyone were destroyed? Is the world that bad today? I mean, I've heard multitudes of people tell me and even, even preachers that, well, it's just, it's, just, it's just really bad today. It's really bad today. That's why things are like they are. 
But I tell you what, if the church is declining or our morals are declining, it's not God's fault. And if you declare it's because of men or something else in the generation in which you live, you're declaring that God is not sovereign. That he has not the power and the ability to sustain his church and his people in the most wicked generation that could ever be. That's the God that you and I serve. That's the one that I believe in. That he has the power and the ability to withhold and uphold the church in the midst of the most wicked generation that could ever be put up on the earth. If the churches are declining and the morals and the nations are falling apart, it's not God's fault, it's our fault. It's because we are not walking in the old paths, in the ways of Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's because other things have distracted us in this life to the point that the Lord Jesus Christ is not the preeminence in our life. That's where he's got to be if you want to be blessed from him. We're told in Malachi 3 that the windows of heaven can open when our ways please the Lord and we cannot possibly receive all the blessings that God could send us. You know, you can serve God and have the greatest life that you could ever imagine. You're not going to lose your joy. You're not going to be able to not do anything. That's a perception that's totally wrong. If you have that perception that I'm going to follow God, I'm going to put him first in my life, and then I ain't going to be able to do nothing because God's first. You've got the wrong perception of God. Matter of fact, the more that you do for the Lord, the more he will bless you. But I want us to have some understanding that this is not anything new when it comes to perception, the things that have happened in the past. You know, Solomon told us in Ecclesiastes, there's not anything new under the sun. What has been is being done now, and what we're doing today will be done in the future. There's nothing new under the sun. That's what the Solomon tells us. Over in the book of Ezra, chapter 3, I want to get two or three verses out of chapter 1 first. We find a condition in the church or among God's people being Israel now. They had been in captivity for 70 years. Numerous times throughout the Old Testament we find that the children of Israel, because of their disobedience, fell under the judgment hand of God. No different than you find yourself individually or uh, collectively as a church or nation today. You know, God suffered it to go along for a great period of time. He's a long-suffering God. We find in Jeremiah, he continued to prophesy to the children of Israel, but finally the Lord said, enough is enough. Sometimes the greatest teacher that we ever have in life is the teacher of experience. And you know, the Lord gets to a point that he allows us to fall on our face, if you would. He teaches us great lessons by the way of experience. He burns out the dross and we come out better for it, even though it's not fun and oftentimes it's painful. But this is what happened to the children of Israel. You know, they fell under God's judgment hand when they walked around uh, Mount Sinai for 40 days, 40 years, excuse me. Most of them died there. They didn't enter into the promised land. But on down the road, years and years later, they fell away again. Jeremiah prophesied what would come, that God's judgment would come, and it came. And he sent a great enemy named Nebuchadnezzar down to Jerusalem. And most of the Hebrew folks were destroyed, but there was a remnant left. God, God didn't completely wipe them off the face of the earth. There was a remnant, and they were taken captive into Babylon. They were exiled there for 70 years. Now, when we begin in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, we begin to see that remnant. They're able to come back home now. The 70-year period is over. They're coming back to Jerusalem, the city of their God, the city of our God, the only true and living God. They come back, and we find in verse 1 of Ezra chapter 1, now in the first year of Cyrus the king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus king of Persia that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, the king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all the people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem. 
which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord, God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. He is the God which is in heaven. So we see now that we're in a period of time that Israel's been through harsh judgment, brought on by God himself because of disobedience, as it's happened time and time again in the lives of God's children. Sometimes it's the only way that we finally learn the lesson that God sends to us. He knows how to get, get his point across eventually. You know, some of us like myself are extremely hard-headed and stubborn and strong-willed, and believe you me, God can get his point across. You can keep going down that road, but when the Lord gets ready to deal with you, he'll deal with you. In chapter 3 it says, And when the seventh month was come, there's only 13 verses in this chapter, and we'll go through them, was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Zodak, Jozak, and brethren of the priest, and Zerubbabel and his brethren, and builded the altar of God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereupon, as it was written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Now, when these folks began to come back from out of captivity and exile, they had a great desire to do what was right in the sight of God. I mean, it made me think about going as Jesus said, and he came unto me talking about prison. You visited me when I was in prison. When you find a man who's in prison, you'll find a man whose head gets a lot clearer because I visited him, I know. He has clear thoughts and a great understanding at that time, but the challenge comes for that man when he's released, when he's let out into the world. That's what happens. They get there, and they got four walls that are not very big. They can't move around very much. They're very limited on what they can do, and it's amazing how clear their thinking becomes, even toward the Lord Jesus Christ. But the challenge of these folks is, is when we go out into the world. Well, this was the challenge, I believe, for the children of Israel, and they understood. We need to do what God called upon us to do. They kept also the Feast of the Tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the custom as the duty of the everyday required, and afterward offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and of all the set feasts of the Lord that were consecrated, of every one that willingly offered a free will offering unto the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month begin they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. Now I'm getting to the point of the difference of perception among the older folks and the younger folks as we go through this chapter. If you'll bear with me. They gave money also unto the masons and unto the carpenters and meat and drink and oil unto Zidion and to the them at Tyre to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the Sea of Joppa according to the grant that they had of Cyrus king of Persia. Now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month, Jerubal the son of Sheatel and, and Jeshua the son of Zozak, the remnant of the brethren and the priests and the Levites all they that were come out of captivity in Jerusalem. Now this is where we're going to begin to get into what I want you to understand. These folks had come out of captivity and exile. You know, 70 years of what you might call imprisonment would give you a lot of time to think about how you ought to act and react and walk and live your life, I think. There was a remnant left. And it says, And appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. So now these folks who had been in disobedience, they were the remnant left. They were taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar and exiled to Babylon for 70 years. They were now back in Jerusalem, their beloved city. There was breaches in the walls. The gates were torn down. They needed houses for their families to live in. And so there, there was much to be done. In Nehemiah chapter 4, it says the people had a mind to work. They had a mind to do a lot of things in serving the Lord their God because of where they had been and where they had come from. But the Levites, those who were in charge of the priesthood from 20 years old and up, were called upon for the work of the house of the Lord. Then stood Jeshua with his sons and brethren, and Kedemiel and his sons and the sons of Judah together to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Hinnadad, with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets 
and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by the course in praising and giving thanks unto God because he is good for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great joy. These people had been in exile. Those that were 20 years old and up were, were appointed to the work of the house of the Lord, the Levites. And as they, after they laid the foundation, being thankful they now had a place once again to go in and worship the Lord their God, they shouted for joy. You and I ought to shout for joy because we've got a place to come to. We've got liberty in this nation to come out and worship God as we see fit to worship Him without being molested or put in danger. They shouted with joy. It goes on and it says, And they sang together in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because He is good. And His mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great joy when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. What is your foundation? What is my foundation? It's the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, the Apostle Paul told us, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our foundation. He is our hope. And he has blessed us to come together as a people to worship his name. But notice verse 12. But many of the priests and the Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men, and that word ancient means old, they were aged, that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice. Now this gets down to perception right here. The young folks were shouting for joy. The old folks were weeping, crying. They had seen the first house, and you know what they were saying? The old church ain't never going to be the same. It ain't going to be like it once was. Things are never going to be like it, it was before. They were weeping. In verse 13, the last verse says, So that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. From a distance, you couldn't tell who was weeping and who was shouting. These young folks were just thankful they had a place to worship God, that a foundation had been laid. But the older folks, they were thinking about the past. Paul said, Forgetting those things which are in the past and look forward. We can't change the past. What is your perception of the church today? There are things in this world we'd all like to change, aren't they? But we have a lot more available to us today sometimes than we actually are thankful for. We have a foundation. We have a building. We have a place to come without being persecuted to worship the Lord our God. It may not always be that way, but we ought to be shouting for joy. Those young folks were shouting for joy. They had a different perspective and perception of what was going on. They were just thankful not to be in exile and captivity any longer, wasn't they? They had laid a foundation. They were ready to build upon that foundation. That foundation being the Lord Jesus Christ. But the old folks were remembering that of the past. You know, I've seen people declare that that's a, a problem among God's people. Saying, well, the old church just ain't never going to be what it was. You know, I remember going to a church years and years ago down in central Texas, and I don't know just which church it was. I went with my great-grandpa uh, Venable, who was an ordained minister. I was a little kid. I do remember they had, when you got ready to go to the bathroom, you went out behind this church and there's a couple of outhouses. Now, I didn't go to a lot of them kind of churches, but I tell you what, I thank God for indoor plumbing. How about y'all? <laughs> Really? I mean, do you want to go back to the old church as it was? I remember going down to the great-grandpa Venables again, and I remember we raised every window. Had no air conditioner, didn't even have a swamp cooler. We raised every window, and we sweated at night till we went to sleep. Them was the good old days, right? How many of these good old folks that have the perception, older folks, who look back and talk about the good old days and the good old church want to go back and live in them good old houses and worship in them good old buildings? They don't. Even in the church at Anton where I grew up, you couldn't go to the restroom on the inside of the building. You had to go out and walk around to the west side and enter from the outside. I mean, we, did, we had hard benches. We didn't have any pads on our benches. I tell you what, people can talk about the old church and the old ways, but none of them want to go back there and live 
worship in the old church, the old buildings, that is, on the old hard benches, you know, there were some of those benches and some of those churches you could get a splinter sitting on them. I mean, it's just, you know, it's all about our perception. These young folks here were shouting for joy because the foundation had been laid and they had a place to worship. We ought to be shouting for joy today and not reminiscing about the past and, and how good it was then and how bad it is now. God has given us a place to worship and given us a hope in Jesus Christ. He is our way. He is the truth and He is our life. Not just eternal life, but the life that we live now. It's all in the way that we perceive things in life. You know, it's unfortunate those who live in the past oftentimes and perceive that the old church and the old ways of life and everything else that you can talk about were better than today are often the folks who are walking around with a sad countenance on their face are not very happy. They look back and they live in the past. Brother Gail preached a message some time ago about being in bondage to the past. There's a lot of folks live in bondage to the past. But we need to be thankful for the present and for the opportunities God has granted us right here today. We ought to be shouting. We still have a place to worship. We still have that same foundation. The Lord Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it's unto Him that we look for our hope, for our blessings, and for change in our life. But remember, serving God is, is not just coming here for an hour on Sunday morning. It's out there amongst God's people in your neighborhood, in your workplace, wherever you might be. You have an opportunity to bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let your light so shine before men that when they see your good works, they will glorify our Father which art in heaven. Service starts as soon as we walk out of this building. And may God bless us next Sunday and the Sunday after to come together to worship his holy and glorious name. But I tell you, we can make a difference out in the world, and that's what we need to do. We can be kind to people. You know, when your perception is right and you have joy in the Lord, you have a greater desire to help folks. You know, when we talked about the ways of the Lord, it, it's not just the doctrines of sovereign grace of how we get to heaven. It's the doctrine of forgiveness, the doctrine of a tame tongue, the doctrine of a meek spirit, the doctrine of kindness. These are all characteristics of Jesus Christ that we're called upon to conform to as we grow in grace and knowledge of our Savior. May God bless us to do that.